The Bempton Cliffs in East Yorkshire are a known spot for bird watching and family walks, but for the Bowling family, they hide the pain of a tragic disappearance. On March 2, 2010, their son Russell left home and was never seen again. His father, Roger, remembers the last words his son said to him that morning. At 8 o'clock he leaves the house. I'm in the kitchen having a cup of tea or something. And he says to me, I'm off now, Dad, see you tonight. And that was the last time he was seen by us. Russell left for college that day, where he was studying a bricklaying course, however, he never arrived at school. Instead, his car was found at RSPB Bempton Cliffs the next day. According to his brother's findings, Russell had researched the bunker situated at Bempton Cliffs that morning before leaving for college. His mother, Christine, remembers the phone call they received when Russell's car was initially found. I took the call in the morning and a policewoman rang and said that they found Russell's car at Bempton. And uh, I immediately passed it over to my husband to deal with. Um, we were surprised because he'd never taken an interest. At the end of 2012, the bunker was searched for a second time with appropriate equipment that would have been able to detect a body, but this investigation returned nothing and the bunker was sealed shut. Russell Bowling has never been seen again. For Russell's family, his disappearance left a big hole in their everyday lives. Roger says that one of the most important things is that the world knows who Russell truly is. His father told the story of how Russell was diagnosed with a speech impediment at age three, but that he was a very happy boy. And a specialist diagnosed that he had a language disorder, that he simply couldn't, that speech had no value to him. He couldn't, he couldn't make any sense of anything we were saying. His parents remember his favorite toys and how his condition progressively improved as he grew up. When he was seven, things got, you know, a lot easier. And um, he started to do some reading and he started to make friends. We had this Lego train set, Duplo Lego train set. And he would spend about an hour and a half constructing some, some Lego track all over the room. You know, he couldn't move and, um, and play with this Lego train set. There was a military museum yes. in, uh, in Beverly, which is near where we live. And they had Second World War tanks and things, and he was just sort of fascinated with clambering over those and stuff. He had a, a boy's interest in war, didn't he? Mm. And he used to like to, they used to have, at the military museum, they used to have um, the toys. They used to sell like second-hand toys, military toys. He loved all that. And <coughs> we used to go along with him, didn't we? Yeah, we haven't thrown them away, we've still got them all. <laughs> he used to start playing, later on, he started playing military games as computers, strategy yeah. games. Roger remembers one of the happiest memories since Russell and his brothers were kids and says he will always keep Russell in his memory as a child he was when he went missing. This is a story about, about the three boys. I'll never forget it. And I hope that, you know, when they say that, you know, when you're about to die, you, you know, your life flashes in in front of you. Well, I, I wouldn't particularly like my life to flash in front of me, but the one thing I would like to think about was this Christmas morning. Um, and this happened without any involvement from, from Christine and I. Andrew and, and, his, and his brother Nigel decided to dress up. Oh, yes, I am. <laughs> That's so funny. Dress up as... Um, Father Christmas and Rudolph the reindeer. Andrew didn't have, Andrew was the reindeer and he didn't, <laughs> he didn't have a reindeer's mask or anything, but he had a cat's mask and he made some antlers for himself. So we had this thing with a cat's mask and antlers and he was wearing some sort of dressing gown or thing that he found that looked like a, 
the skin of a, of a reindeer. And Nigel had a red dressing gown and put on a fake beard and... And a black bin bag with toys in it. Yeah, a black bin bag with, with toys in it. I don't know what sort of toys they were. And they crept into, into Russell's bedroom and, you know, woke him up. And, you know, he, he, he was right into it, he was laughing and joking. And Christine and I were sort of downstairs waiting for the boys to do. And they came creeping down the stairs in character. And, oh, it was a wonderful morning. And um, it was so happy. And, um, you know, I think, you know, that so sticks, sticks in my mind. And that's how I, you know, I think of Russell when I think of him. I don't think of him as a, a man of, what would he be, 27 or 28 or something, and how he would be now. My, 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 when I, when I imagine him, it's always you know, in the past. After 10 years since Russell went missing, his father says he hasn't overcome his son's disappearance and believes therapy cannot help in his situation. He was, he was a perfectly happy young man. But if he has voluntarily disappeared, then I've let him down. Because for some reason, I didn't see it, and he couldn't tell me. And, you know, I'm his father, and if he can't tell me, it was because of a barrier that I must have erected. And so, I am responsible. I don't want someone telling me, you're not responsible. I want someone to tell me, you are responsible, do something about it. So I don't believe in. I don't believe in trying to mitigate the pain. You know, yes, you must be responsible. He was your son. He's gone. How could you not have known that? How could you, as any type of father or parent, you know, not have the understanding that your child is unhappy? It's rubbish. And so I do hold myself entirely responsible. So I don't need therapy, I don't want therapy, I am responsible. And you have to live with that responsibility and it has to motivate what you do about it. <laughs> you know, we're not the victims. We live in a, in a crazy society, absolutely crazy society. It helps offer to the wrong people. But I had to go to therapy. My employer insisted that I went to therapy. And the people were saying, you know, I can imagine, you know, the trauma that you're going through. No, you can't. No, you can't. You didn't know Russell. You didn't know, you know, what I feel about Russell. You're talking just things that people say because they don't know what to do. His brother, Andrew, still remembers the last time he spent with Russell and how he managed to cope with his disappearance. I came home from university, dressed as a full-on student, and then he asked me to, you know, can you take me shopping to buy some clothes? I said, I have to take him shopping, we were playing a game. Although we both, we still like to play computer games, especially strategy games. And he was playing a game, and I was playing the same game on my computer that was in a different room. And then I suggested we play, we can play against each other, which we did. And he thoroughly won. And he was so pleased that he won. No, there was no bringing, it didn't bring us together to support each other. No, that didn't really happen. We all dealt with it in our own different ways. I, I supported more, I leaned more on my friends. My university friends rather than my family to get myself through it. The theories surrounding Russell's disappearance are many. 
Throughout the years, the world has speculated that the young boy either joined the cult or committed suicide. However, the most shocking theory of all surrounds his father. Roger was convicted following the discovery of pornographic images involving children, only six months after Russell went missing. He explains this came as a result of his Parkinson's disease medication, which triggered compulsive behavior. When Russell disappeared, I said that they were treating it as a missing persons case and didn't seem to be doing anything apart from looking for his body. I said to them, take the family computer. Take the family computer to see if he's been on it, what he's been looking at and um, what you can find. I said, it has to be eliminated from the inquiry. So they said, we'll take all the computers in the house. I said, yes, take all the computers in the house because we all had a shared password so you could on this computer. But I'm not even sure we had passwords. And um, they took my um, computer and they found on it an uh, excessive amount of pornography. And uh, I think uh, I'm right in saying that it was something like 14,500 images that I downloaded. Now these images that I downloaded were drawn images or um, computer graphic images. Um, but I'd become addicted to to pornography um, around about a year before Russell disappeared, um, particularly Japanese pornography, because a lot of drawn pornography is Japanese. It's yeah, um, hentai porn. And um, I've been prescribed, I've been diagnosed with um, with Parkinson's in late 2008 and I started, was given medication for uh, Parkinson's disease in early 2009. Parkinson's is all related to dopamine and dopamine is the thing that's naturally released into your body to get a high. You know, you have a dopamine rush. And I got a high from looking at pornography. And I became addicted to it, genuinely addicted. It wasn't a casual thing, it was obsessive. Obsessive, you know, I had to, whatever the next picture was that I found, I had to download it. I was driven to download it. And, um, you know, over a period of, of that year, from 2009 to 2010, you know, I downloaded 14,500 images and I was obsessed with downloading the next image and I had no regard for what type of pornography it was, it was everything. So, anyways, when they looked through the computer they found, I think, it was 62 images what's called um, category one images of a child under 13. They said, how do you plead? I said, guilty. I said, I'll get more publicity. And then I can tell the truth and talk about Russell. Roger says he still struggles with guilt every day and his search won't stop until Russell is found. I've never cried for him. And I want to. But I feel as though I can't do it because the job's not finished. I want to be punished for having let him down. That's the reality. I want to be punished 
for failing him. I don't want to be consoled. Here at Bempton Cliffs, walks and bird watching continue uninterrupted. But for the Bowling family, the search for their missing son and brother is still ongoing.